The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, next week, this is our next to last lecture. I'll be giving uh, the last lecture in the series next Monday night at 6. Um, and the title of my talk is uh, To See is the Root of Idea. In fact, uh, the word idea comes from the Greek verb to see. Uh, so I'll be talking both about my own work and reflecting on the series uh, as a whole. But tonight we have with us Leslie Tuttle, who has had a couple of different careers. She started out in the first 10 years as a photojournalist, working for a Turkish development foundation and uh, Oxfam America, photographing in Turkey. And then she came back to the US, got her MBA, and worked for eight years setting up a, a nonprofit firm here in um, Cambridge called Consens the Consensus Building Institute. Mm -hmm. In 2000, she was contacted by one of the children uh, who was living in London uh, in 2000, one of the children that she had photographed in the Turkish one of the Turkish villages in the 1970s, because he knew that she had these photographs of his village, and there was a photography exhibit being organized in London of the past 50 years of this particular Turkish village. They invited Leslie to contribute photographs to this exhibit, and curious, she decided to go back to the Turkish village and reacquaint herself with the people there. And that started off on a whole other project, which she's going to share with you tonight. Um, the early photographs in the 1970s being in black and white, and the more recent work since 2000 is in color. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Well, um, I have talked for about 45 minutes and show you about 100 photographs, sometimes quickly and sometimes pausing to more to say about certain ones. And then I look forward to Professor Robot's commentary and I'm happy that there are people here not just from this academic world but from other worlds of TV and radio production that might also join in to make the conversation um, lively. So let me begin. Um, today is May 1st, International Workers' Day. I mention this because I'm thinking about how profound being in a certain place at a certain time can be in terms of experiencing catalytic public events. On this day in 1977, I was in Taksim Square, Istanbul's largest modern square, along with thousands of families, students, and workers who were out there in a holiday mood to celebrate International Workers' Day. It was during a period of political anarchy. So some say it was the CIA, and some say it was the Turkish military who allowed snipers to go to the rooftops of the hotels in Taksim and fire shots down upon the crowd, causing panic and stampede. Although I'd been in protests and riots in the US during the Vietnam era, I'd never feared for my, feared for my life quite as much as I did then and there. 34 people were killed, and many were crushed and injured. There are May 1st, 9-11s, and Hurricane Katrina's in many of our lives when being there at a certain place and then at a specific moment makes, makes for unforgettable and irrevocable drama. However, I'm not here to talk about a single abrupt life-changing event. Rather, I'm here to describe significant changes that occurred in over 30, women, uh, 30 years to a group of people that all came from the same place. I will show the place they came from, where they went, and how migration changed them. This is the story about how change of place can cause dramatic shifts in people's lives. It's not news to any of you that urban migration changes how people think and live. As city planners, architects, and 21st century citizens, this phenomena is very apparent. I'm not a sociologist, a visual anthropologist, or a city planner. I'm a photojournalist. In the 70s and 80s, 
I worked for 10 years for not-for-profits, including Oxfam America, where my job was to show through individual stories in pictures and words how economic and social development might occur, starting from the bottom up. We were very idealistic. There is an ongoing debate in photojournalism or social documentary photography about the role of the photographer, the photographer's ability or even attempt to be objective, and about the vitality or effectiveness of telling stories with an agenda in mind. It interests me to discuss these issues and I would gladly do so. As I'm not an academic, I have no claim to a significant statistical pool or a generalized theory. But this position I will defend and present here is that by sharing the stories of things we have personally witnessed, we may be able to deepen and broaden other people's view of the world, views of the world, just as storytelling reaches from one generation to the next in all cultures and in many forms, often with lasting lessons and insights worth sharing. My claim, my story in words and photographs, is about how urban migration made feminists out of very traditional village women. This is something I discovered, and I decided I wanted to show it to others. These stories are also about the, oops, the little, that, goodbye. Um, these stories are also about how the impact of and outcomes of migration vary for different individuals depending upon who they are and where they went. It appears from the women that I met that going to a major city in another country might not provide as great an improvement as migrating to a city in your own country, in this case, Turkey. Then there are those who ultimately um, return to the village. The way people recollect the village life is also a part of the story, along with their general reflections about what has been lost and what has been gained by the move to urban areas. Lastly, I will look at the meaning of the that the village holds for some of these people today. If these stories serve no other purpose than to challenge you to rethink your assumptions, and I'm borrowing this phrase from Martin Krieger, who was here last week, then I think it will be worth the effort. The subtitle, by the way, that I've always wanted to use the story, the, for these stories is, Don't Judge a Woman by Her Headscarf. The people you're about to see were all born in the same village, Topardic, near Sivas in central Turkey. All of the black and white photos are from 1974 to 1978. Everything in color is from 2000 to 2004. I was working in the 1970s as a photojournalist um, for a Turkish development foundation based in Ankara. One of my colleagues, Veys, was from this village in central Anatolia, where he brought me and introduced me to the people and to the place. A key character in this story is Fadime. I met Fadime on my first visit to Topardic in 1975. Fadime and I were both 25 years old. Only I was a single American, and she had been married at age 13 and was pregnant with her sixth child. But there she was, harvesting wheat with a scythe in the middle of the field in the midday sun. She dropped everything and made us tea right out there in the middle of the field. I looked at her with awe. Uh, she says about herself and some of the women of the, her friends at the time that the work was on the back of the women, that we were like stones. A bond of friendship grew between us, and even though I left the country for more than two decades, she and the other women haunted me. I needed to see what had become of them. Twenty-five years later, I went back to Fatime's village to find out whether our friendship had been ephemeral. As it turned out, our connection was immediate. She told me about the major transitions in her life. She had been elected the village leader, the Muhtar. Her children had migrated to Turkish cities and England. What was the name of the place? Topardic, it's near Kongal and near Sivas. Um, after hearing and seeing uh, the dramatic changes that I, I had occurred in the village, including the end of, of animal husbandry, I set about to tell her story and to tell the story of the other village women. 
Let's start by looking back at village life in this place in the 1970s. Topardic is a, is a Kurdish village and therefore it was settled in a hidden valley so the Turkish militia couldn't find them when they were looking for conscripts and taxes. This village was inaccessible by public transportation, perhaps a two hour walk to the nearest ride. There was no electricity until 1985. There was one central village well. Over a period of 30 years, there was never more than a primary school, mostly attended by boys, and now there's no school at all. The village's subsistence came from animal husbandry, mostly sheep and goats, but with some families having a few cows and chickens. People ate meat perhaps once a meat or when a visitor like myself appeared. They produced cheese and milk and uh, yogurt rather. They grew wheat and barley and did some seasonal tradings with the vendors in town for tea and sugar and kerosene. The winters were long and harsh and isolating. Uh, dried dung was the main source of fuel and um, during the past 100 years, most of the surrounding trees um, had been cut down. They had once been available for building the home construction and posts such as these with the um, interesting post and beam, possibly a design comes from Iran, you might, uh, architects might tell me more about that. But the houses consisted of a kitchen storage room such as this and an indoor stable. And then there'd be a living room with the divan around the edge. The divan, I believe, is a, per a Persian word in, used in Turkish for that structure along the outer wall that's used for both um, sitting and sleeping. The population of the nearest uh, town was Sunni Turk, who prohibited the Kurdish children from coming to their schools and also just shunned them in general. This prejudice was doubled because these Kurds were Alevi, and a sect that, although Muslim, were to the Sunnis as, within Protestantism, the Unitarians are to the Baptists. So, um, The migration out of the village to Turkish and European cities began in the 70s and accelerated in the 80s. By 1990, all of the able-bodied men and families had left the village and animal husbandry had ceased. The weaving of rugs and the Alevi ceremonial practices also came to an end. Only the elderly and a few isolated families stayed in the village year-round. Most people maintained their ties by returning for summer visits. I'd add an aside that when I showed this picture in the village in the year 2000, everyone who looked at it said, they're all dead. When I returned to the village, I looked for women I had known and photographed in the 70s. I interviewed them to find out what, they, uh, what had happened in their lives. Kiraz, here in the center, was one of those who bounced back and forth between the city and village over the years. Here's a bit of her history and her own words. We worked as agricultural workers when we were young girls. We used to go from the village to Sivas to work in the fields. We were very poor. We used to go work and bring back some food. They would give us bread and sugar. We made our living on these things. Then I got married and moved to Adana with my husband. I didn't go to work in the fields after I was married. I cleaned houses. I cleaned windows, doors. I wiped floors. I did laundry with my hands. Then my husband died. We didn't have any money. I brought his body to the village with help of the neighbors. I was left alone to look after my four children without a husband. I suffered many hardships. I sometimes went to Adana and sometimes stayed in the village. I didn't let go of my land. I protected my land. I grew poplars in the fields and sold them. We had sheep. At one point I came back to the village, sold the sheep and bought a tractor. We also sold rugs. Yes, we are better off now. Nowadays everybody can go to school. Everybody works. I managed to live with the help of my daughters. One daughter is in Germany with her husband, another in Canada, but she's divorced. The third went to Israel to work. I don't even have a pension. My sons are very poor. One works, but they can only feed themselves. Well, to speak the truth, it is my daughters who give help to their mother, not my sons. I get along with the help of my daughters. 
Thirty years ago, the women earned no cash, had no control of family wealth, and if they had cash, they never would have been able to decide on their own to give part of their income to their mothers instead of their husbands or fathers. <clears throat> Here's my friend Fadime. With her daughter Sema in 1975 on the left, and on the right is Sema with her son in 2001. Fatima says of marriage, I was married in the old-fashioned way by an arranged marriage. I was born in 1951 and married in 1964. It's very hard to be married at such a young age. Young girls were married off to men whom they'd never met before. Women had no right to speak. No bride was allowed to speak with her elders. It was only a nod for yes and a for no. Now young people choose their own partners. They can speak openly and sit at the dinner table together. Two daughters got married to the men of the, my two daughters got married to the men of their choice. They fell in love. They told us. We consented. They were both happily married. This next woman, Chake, a neighbor of Fadime's in the 70s, has a typical migration story. Here is Chake making bread in the old way, uh, then by that hearth, and then 25 years later in front of the same hearth that is no longer in use in the village. She migrated to the city with her husband and children. They live in a modest concrete block house with modern appliances. She has spent the last 25 years cleaning houses in order to pay for the children's education and to afford a city home. Here's her son Neaza as a child with the lambs in the village. And now, seated in the center, he's a university graduate. Chake's daughter, Sibel, is seen here in the village in her youth. Now she sits with her mother in Sibel's fancily furnished living room. Sibel has worked in retail stores and is active in a left-leaning Alevi political party. Her husband is Turkish. He runs a record store and doesn't speak a word of Kurdish. The fact that Sibel is working that she engages in political activity, that she has married a Turk, and that she insists she will not have children were all unthinkable ideas for her mother's generation and for centuries of generations before them. The material wealth and comforts that come with city life are one of the most obvious and common improvements. The backbreaking labor that characterized women's work in the village is lessened by the running water, electricity, appliances available in the city. That these possessions are cherished in this way is understandable. How, however, much of the population that initially moved to the city maintained a village-style life in their neighborhoods, their ghettos. Here in the city of Adana, with a population of nearly two million, the, woman, the women gather to wash and dry peppers together in the street, just as they might have in the village. Bread making for special occasions takes place in the street. The male-only kavehane is also there. Suna, once a resident of Topardich, is seen here on her rooftop in Adana, where she has cleaned other people's houses for several decades while her husband had a job in the city. This, the exterior of her home, is in an old neighborhood inhabited by hundreds of people from Tobardich. On the outside is a blue concrete block, and on the inside, some notion of Italian Rococo in a parlor where only holiday guests are entertained. And here, Suna's mother in the family room with the ever-present, always-on television. One of Suna's daughters is a, trained in textile design and has eloped, much to Suna's dismay, to Istanbul with an older man. One son left for England when he was 16, and he's been driving a red double-decker bus while supporting a family there. He doesn't visit because if he came back, he would have to do a two-year military service in Turkey. The other son and daughter-in-law run a kebab shop in Adana. Suna and her husband are retired now, spending half of the year in the retirement home they built back in the village that has a swimming pool for the grandkids, water, solar water heaters, and two satellite dishes. For many, um, for many from the generation that moved to the city and got their education there, 
the recreated life of the village lifestyle in the city of, the, of their parents is unacceptable. So they have tried to move away from those tight-knit communities in the city and have sought a new lifestyle in a new setting. That's Layla. Here she is entertaining her mother and Suna in a high-rise in her high-rise home. They all once lived in Topardich. Although her mother is illiterate, Layla has a university degree and teaches high school art. Her husband is an engineer whom Layla, Layla chose when she married him at 26. In Layla's words, we are not very close to the people who migrated from the village. They, we don't want to be close to them. You know about that culture, the background of that society. It's not a very modern society. We wanted to raise our child in a more developed society. We've become aware of the advantages of living in a developed environment with different people. In contrast, here's Layla's mother, who sums up her life this way. With my mother and father, I had a very simple village life. Cattle, sheep, cows. I never went to school. Of course, there was no school when I was a child. The school was built later. <coughs> my mother and father couldn't afford to send me away to school. <coughs> they didn't care much about sending girls to school. I got married when I was 15, then I came to Adana. We suffered a lot. We were poor. I had three babies. I worked as a house cleaner. I had to bear all the expenses and the burdens of sending two children to school. We only worked, just like slaves. And now we have a normal life, not rich, not poor. My daughter is a teacher. My son is a veterinarian. We're doing well. In the past, women didn't have any rights. It's better now. Here's Fatime's oldest daughter, Elvin, seen in a as a child in the photo, um, on the left-hand photo in the center row back, and more recently on the right. She lives in the city of Izmit, on the shores of the Marmara Sea, about an hour east of Istanbul. The Marmara Sea is the large body of water between the Bosphorus and before the Dardanelles that separates the Black Sea from the Mediterranean, right over the earthquake fault. Elvin grew up in the village where she got a few years of schooling. For a time, she was sent to relatives in Istanbul to attend high school. Then she cared for her older brother Ali's first child as its mother for five years when Ali and his wife migrated illegally to England. Eventually, Elvin met and got engaged to a man whose family had left the village when he was young. They courted, and she followed him where his medical studies led him. Over many years, she completed a university degree in, high school man in uh, hotel management. Here are some of her thoughts about the change between the generations. Our generation is the bridge between these two generations. I would tell, if I were to tell my child this whole process in the future, he would not understand it. The generation prior to ours thought that having children was for making them work and to take care of their parents in their old age. Parents wanted their children to become their guarantees for their future support. Raising kids was analogous to raising workers. After our generation, this mentality was not the same because people understood the importance of education. Regarding decisions from every aspect, my father used to make a decision and my mother used to obey it. At that time, many girls were sent outside the village so they could continue their education. When my father went outside the village, had different friends, saw different lifestyles, he understood what went, that when people studied more, they would become more powerful. All this influenced his changing. My father made the decision I would go to Istanbul and attend secondary school. Frankly speaking, my mother wasn't consulted at all. In my married life, we have a democracy from every aspect. If we have to make a final decision about something, we absolutely talk. Our marriage is a dialogue, it's essential. We can even talk about a very trivial detail. If I have to persuade him to do something for sure, I will do so, and vice versa. Elvin lives in the high-rise complex, but she chooses to go to the green grocer down the road instead of the nearby supermarket. Now let's go from Elvin's market in Izmit to a market in London. In the back, the Cafe Millennium is 
Elvin's older brother, Ali's Cafe. They serve British breakfast all day and kebabs. Ali is the, uh, the boy in the front right and his the, uh, siblings in the village in 1976. This is where he lives in public housing in London. The BMW in the front is his. He came to London on false visas with his wife 12 years ago. He left his infant son with Elvin because they had no insurance that the, assurance that the journey would be safe or that they would be able to sustain themselves once they arrived. For seven years, they worked 15 to 18 hours a day in a sweatshop by day and doing sewing piecework at night. This way they paid off the gang, the 5,000 pounds per person it cost them to get into England. In addition, Ali and his wife worked to pay for his two brothers and youngest sister, Bergazar, to come in on false visas. One of them brought in his son, Arif, then five years old, as their own. This is a Victorian building converted into a mosque in one of the Turkish neighborhoods in London. There are an estimated 300,000 Turks and Kurds living in London. Most of the first generation, like Ali, stay in their neighborhood, speak hardly any English, and survive on employment generated within the community. The British policy is that if you declare yourself a political refugee and do not leave England, uh, Tur yeah, do not leave England for Turkey for 10 years, you are granted British citizenship. Ali lived in England for 10 years without returning to Turkey. What does this policy mean for Fadime, their mother? It means that of her six children, she has not seen four of them for 10 years. The British would not grant her an official visa, visit, uh, visa to visit them. Ali reflects about the impact of immigration on himself, his siblings, um, and his family. And these reflections I think provide some insight on how others in his situation might feel. Surely he doesn't speak for everyone, but the concerns he expresses provide a succinct summary of the costs and trade-offs many immigrants knowingly or unknowingly encounter. Uh, for this reason and because of the clear way he articulates the issue, I will share with you a lengthy portion of a 2004 interview I had with him. <coughs> This is Ali. Why was our desire to go abroad so great? Well, we got hoodwinked. Our friends dazzled us, not telling us the whole truth about their lives there, what conditions they had suffered. They implied with their behavior and dress that the life, what the lifestyle was there was, wasn't really. The people who first experienced difficulties abroad didn't tell about these things to other people. On the contrary, they exhibit only the good side, nice clothes, food, jewelry, things they hadn't seen before, which were very attractive to the people. This arises from our ignorance and unconsciousness. In our society, keeping up with the Joneses still persists, as was the case of people going to Istanbul from the villages. This time, the same thing happened with the people going abroad, giving false images about life there. These people caused the creation of a false image, like money was collected either from the trees or off the streets so easy. We went to the big city for all the same reason. Turkey's resources are insufficient. People started this adventure with the hopes of attaining better possibilities and living conditions in other countries and other lands. Maybe some of us did get better conditions economically. We did get some material benefits. This, we all, starting with me, have to think about. Maybe some of us earned money, but was this the sole aim of our coming here? The important part is what we lost morally in our values. We were introduced to money here. There were times when I said, I wish I had money, but now I criticize myself and I hate money. All right, one has to have enough money to live on, but if it only is a means. Now I'm asking first to myself and then to all the community, did money make you happy instead? We lost our values, customs and traditions, dances, music, our respect, our love. What money can bring these back to us? There used to be respect for the elderly. There were good human relations. There was no money, but there were moral values. I lived these things myself in Turkey. I didn't watch these things in movies or read them in books. I know this from my own experience. I'm not objecting to the way other societies live. 
A British child acts according to how he's brought up. That's only normal. But why should I try to imitate their lives? Why should we immediately want to assimilate into British culture? None of us adults can even speak English. We have lost control of the children. They are the ones speaking English. We need them to interpret for us at the schools, and they can easily fool us. Who is guilty if you don't teach your culture to your children? In the end, life isn't about earning money, wearing nice clothes, and riding in nice cars. Many here enjoy their residence permit, but they don't, don't they feel insulted when they are treated as second-class citizens in the airports at customs? People with British passports just pass by while the others wait in queues. Isn't this a double standard? Look at the lives of my parents, Jafer and Fadime. No washing machine, no dishwasher, no car. Their children have all of these. They have everything, appliances, instruments, vehicles. But here, if we go back to the same point, what is important here? Whose moral values were more precious? Who is more worthy as a human being? Who is more admired, more trustworthy, more dependable as a friend who keeps his promises or how he hosts a guest in his house? We can conclude that money is not everything. A human being is a human being no matter if he has money or not. In some ways, Fatime in the village has lived a better life. Here is Fatime's youngest daughter, Berguzar, in a London cafe. The school in the village had closed by the time she was old enough to go. This was in part due to the fact that most of the families had migrated out of the village and only returned in the summer. So she was sent to be living with relatives in Adana to attend school. However, at age 16, before she finished high school, Ali sent for her to come to England. She's 24 now, eight years into the 10 before she can return to Turkey and see her mother again. She is supported by her brother, working sometimes in the cafe. Her main passion is Kurdish and Turkish folk music, which she learned first from her father, who you see now with his saws back in the 70s. She continues to practice and to sing with her brothers in London. Her dream is to make a cassette, but she is dissatisfied about trying to make their music in a foreign country. She says, I want to be involved in music to communicate with other people via music. When it comes to the words and the message, a certain kind of music can be best understood only by the people who live in that country. You can be much more productive when you're in your own country and it's music. But here, so far away from home, one is only inspired to write songs about missing home, and after a while, that's not enough. My mind is always in Turkey, every moment I live in this country. We have always lived a half and half dissatisfied life. What I want now most is to be able to go there to satisfy my longings. We live between two cultures, which adds extra responsibilities, leaves us depressed and discouraged. It is ironic that with so many more opportunities, we end up being so much more negative. Here is Sinan, also one of the Fadime sons who came to London. Like Berguzar, he is a musician. He is the babe in arms with Fadime on the right. For a while, he and Ali ran a music school in London to teach the local kids Kurdish and Turkish folk music and how to play the saz. It was a gathering place for the youth of the community, but it didn't pay the rent, so it eventually shut down. Sinan plays sometimes at nightclubs in the Turkish neighborhoods. He is talented musically and very charming, but I haven't been able to get a straight answer out of him about what he, how he spends his days. <laughs> now I want to return with you to Topardic to see after 30 years of migration, who remains there and what their views are. Here's Fadime's father-in-law, Hassan Baba. One of the reasons Fadime stays in the village is to take care of him. He refuses to live in the city. In an interview, he said to me, I don't like cities. The village life is good enough for me. Dry bread, cold water, that's good enough. The mountain bird doesn't fit in a vineyard, and a vineyard bird doesn't belong in the mountain. This is Hassan Baba in 1976 with his late wife. When I asked him about the changes he'd seen in his lifetime, he commented, in the past, the women wouldn't go about with their heads uncovered. A bride wouldn't go out for a month. Now it is all free. There is a civilized understanding. 
old heads become new heads. But the old days were heaven compared to today. There was goodness and blessing. There was humanity. The elders and the young people were aware of the difference and the distance between them and respected each other. I am much older than you, but whoever you are, what it all comes down to is good manners, honor, kindness, and mercy. Hanum Shimshek, Fatime's next door neighbor, recently became a widow. She refuses to move to the city um, on her son's invite uh, as long as she can take care of herself in the village. A few years ago, her eldest daughter, was politically, who was politically active, got involved in terrorist activities and was shot dead. She reflects on the old times. Before, there was great poverty. Even though we suffered a lot, we still longed for those days. We were better. We were happier then. We were all together then with our children. Now conditions may be much better, but there is no family, just loneliness. There are also younger people and families who return to the village for months at a time. This young woman is Chidem. She spent her part of her youth in the village and then got a few years' education while living in Adana. Her parents took them with her to Israel when she was 15. She worked there as a babysitter and a house cleaner until the age of 22. She was impressed with the orderliness and the lifestyle in Israel and would like to return there. However, now she's engaged and waiting out her time before the wedding with the in the village with her grandmother. She and her mother are still recovering from a traumatic experience um, due to the earthquake that came to li claimed the lives of 30,000 in 1999. Jidem and her mother were in the same apartment in Yalova with Jidem's brother and uncle when the earthquake occurred. The men were crushed to death when the building collapsed. Jidem and her mother were saved. Jidem will move to Istanbul where her fiancé works after the wedding. But for now, she is happy with the village life, socializing with all the younger people that come as vacationers during the summer months. Fatime, however, still lives in Topardich year-round with a few dozen households, mostly elderly, who stay through the winter. After her husband died, she stepped forward and got herself elected to become the first female village head, the Mukhtar. To have a female Mukhtar brought broke with centuries of tradition. This is her living room from which she conducts village business. As a Mukhtar, she has made major improvements, including road construction, a new central well and water system, and the construction of a village house. Her, does, her husband died tragically 10 years ago, so Fariwe wears mostly the traditional black of widows but has introduced a few muted colors and pants into her wardrobe. Fatima talks to her children in England by the phone and watches the, uh, the videotapes that they send. The wonder of this woman is that she has made these dramatic changes without migrating herself. This is how she expresses herself about migrating to do work in the city. Fatime, the changes started about 30 years ago when people, including my husband, went to work in the city. He did not want his children to stay in the village and just be farmers or shepherds like himself. We moved to the city, but we couldn't manage. I can do any kind of hard village work, but the city work, forgive me, cleaning toilets and washing other people's underwear, I couldn't go along with that. That kind of work affects a person's pride. So we moved back to the village. In the summer, the village fills up with families from the cities who rebuild old houses, adding appliances and satellite dishes. They hold celebrations for weddings and circumcis circumcisions and the anniversary of their dead with the ceremonies and village-wide banquets. Many people who have died in the cities are brought back to the village to be buried. The old traditional gravestones are being replaced with elaborate marble ones similar to those in the, seen in the modern cities. Here is Jafir's tombstone, paid for by Fatime's children living abroad who could not return to Turkey to attend the funeral. This procession walks to 
the graveyard to sacrifice a lamb that will contribute to the meal that the family of the remembered dead pre prepares for the hundreds of people who come to the memorial. The dead man was a young political activist who was shot a year ago. His memory is honored, prayers are said, dirges are sung, and the community comforts all of those who have loved ones who were buried there. At first glance, the words most of us that would use to describe this place, this village, Topardich, are in the middle of nowhere or God forsaken. It takes 16 hours and three different buses to get from Topardich from Istanbul. Why do people come back? What is special about this place? What meaning does it have to them that they cannot find in Istanbul or Adana or London? No one is returning to tend sheep. The rugs that were made her once will never be woven again. Eventually, none of the elderly will remain for the winter. But I imagine that Ali and Bear Gazar will try to describe the spirit of Topardich in the songs that they will write. I began by saying that I would show you how urban migration made feminists out of traditional village women. This was the discovery I made and the finding that encouraged me to tell their stories. I purposely use the term feminist to provoke discussion about what these women have achieved. No one has ever used the word feminist in their conversations with me. They have never been, no one in these pictures, they have never been a part of any organized feminist organization. Yet, in my view, they are feminist by their actions and by their accomplishments in the light of the centuries they've of tradition they've had to overcome. For the older generation of illiterate women, such as Chake, this pursuit of a feminist path involved taking a job outside the home, receiving wages and controlling a part or all of the money, and participating in key economic decisions affecting the family. For their daughter's generation, feminist action involved insisting on an education, choosing their own husbands, and marrying later in life so that they could finish their education. It also involved taking advantage of health services, including contraception. Both in the village and in the city, women for the first time joined political organizations and took, or took political office. Once my efforts to document their stories were underway, the most surprising thing I discovered was that the women who migrated to England experienced far fewer improvements in their lives other than material conference than the women who migrated within Turkey to Turkish cities. Their lack of training and limits on their job opportunities in England restricted their personal development and independence. I assume that language and social barriers are the reason for this. It will be interesting to see what changes, and we might dare to call them improvements, that their children who have grown up in British schools might experience. When we ask the question, what part of your traditions do you want to leave behind, and what part do you want to hold on to? There are many answers spanning the gamut from those who have even started to mythologize the life of the village, and those who want nothing to do with the past. It will be intriguing to see which qualities of visual, visual, sorry, visual life are retained and transformed in the context of modern urban settings. <clears throat> I hope you've enjoyed meeting my friends. All of them took the trouble to share their stories with me. I think at least in part because they were proud of how much they had accomplished. I consider it my, John, my honor to um, share their accomplishments and tell their stories to the broadest possible audience. I hope I've, take, I've shaken your assumptions about the impact of rural to urban migration and the power of Turkish village women to change their lives. Thanks. This lecture is co-sponsored uh, by the City Design and Development Program and by the Audicon Program for Architecture at MIT. And I've asked Nasser Rabat, who's the director of the program, the professor of architecture here at MIT, to make some comments before we open uh, the floor to a general discussion. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
and couldn't have chosen a worse person than me to make these comments, but I'll make them nonetheless. Um, thank you, Leslie. It was very beautiful. I should start by saying that the visual quality of your images are really stupendous, and I enjoyed them tremendously. I also enjoyed the way you woven your narrative. Your narrative is actually f flowing in extremely story-like way, although you are using social sciences tools of interviewing and sort of like bringing in the interviews in, and you even use statistics every now and then, and you use actually all sorts of like hard data, but nonetheless, I guess actually most of us have enjoyed it more as a story than anything else, listening to what she's saying. So thank you for that. I have two comments. One is to speak about immigration, and of course actually I know something about it myself. I am an immigrant myself probably actually half of you are immigrants or planning to be if you are not already. <laughs> um, and, uh, I'm going to make a few comments on immigration. Some of them are scholarly and, and based basically on my profession as a historian. And uh, some of them are personal and perhaps actually a little bit even um, um, existential. Um, the historical one, I kept on thinking while I was listening that we are now constantly being barraged with the notion of immigrants around the world. 150 million, dollar, um, million dollars, 150 million individuals are at this point in time supposedly immigrants in different places in the um, first world coming from the third world. A humongous number, we are supposed to constantly think of it as a problem. Of course, all of you are aware of the fact that today is not just the 1st of May and the International uh, Labor Day, but also it's the day of protest about the new immigration laws. Um, all of us have witnessed since 9-11 the changes, the tightening of immigration laws in the West. And as a matter of fact, actually, even the, the mere temerity and, 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 in a sense, actually, even the mere... Uh, hypocrisy of the policymakers in the first world about who they are going to let in and who they are not going to let in and sort of like somehow categorizing people in different ways, people with high degrees in sciences and engineering and computer sciences are welcome in, in many places. As a matter of fact, the U.S. is copying the German immigration law. Many of you probably know that in the way we are moving now. But all of that is just bringing to my mind something else. It's funny how short our collective memories are. Europe is actually the place that have produced the most number of immigrants in history. Europe is the one that actually for four centuries solved all of its problems by sending people out and in a sense actually colonizing the rest of the uh, discovered world or the world that is being discovered and some of the world that was already discovered and sort of like Europeans or people of European origins claiming that uh, the people living in it were not worth it or didn't deserve it or whatever it is, so we remove them and take their place. So immigration is really not a new, history, new story in the world. It's a very, very old story in the world. And the immigration story that we were looking at here today is part of this sort of like continuous movement of humanity over all of its time, as, I mean, from the beginning on. But I was struck by your comparison between people moving to the cities in Turkey and, of course, people moving to London. Most of the examples that we've looked at are in London. And that led me to reflect upon my own case. And uh, I was wondering, I mean, I, for example, and I'll, I'll, this is sort of like a bit of personal history, I stayed in this country after I finished my education not because of the economic benefits of being in this country, but because of what is probably going to be uh, uh, to turn out to be an extremely false belief that this country provides me with the freedom that I was lacking in the country that I'm coming from. <laughs> because as you all know, actually, at this point in time, someone like me cannot really express himself freely in this country. As a matter of fact, I can't tell you my real opinion now here, uh, despite the fact that we believe that we are living in a free environment. Um, so having said that, uh, of course, there we have an extremely classical story of immigration of uh, people who are going to improve their lot in life and, of course, actually paying the heavy price. The, uh, um, the falafel uh, seller in uh, Central Square, some years ago, my wife and I stopped there and we, somebody told us that in Central Square there's this like, fabulous place that uh, prepares falafel just like home. Home for me is Syria, for my wife it's Egypt, so we actually have 
different opinions about what falafel is. The Egyptians call it tamiya, it's made differently, and so on and so forth. So we wanted to compare. We landed there. It was a shop owned by a Syrian, still is, as a matter of fact, it's in Central Square. And the person that was preparing the falafel was Egyptian. So it was, it was exactly what we were looking for. The guy said he was working 15 hours a day, exactly the same as the kids of Fatime. He was making $70 or so, and his expenses were $75 a day. So he was actually borrowing from the owner of the business. And he had been here for two years, and he hadn't saved a single penny, of course. He was indebted to the owner of the business. He was working way above his capacity. And I said, well, what were you doing where you came from? He said, I came from Alexandria, and I owned a shoe shop there. And I'm like, what brought you here? It's the same question. I mean, here we have examples in Turkey of people who went to Turkish cities and made it and somehow improved their lives there and people who went looking for ways to improve in their lives elsewhere, in, in, in the West in this case, who did not improve their lives. As a matter of fact, actually, they sacrificed their lives. These are people who have lived in England for 10 years without the ability of, being, of, of going back home, totally deprived economically, totally deprived socially, feeling alienated. Uh, Ali's testimony is, is harrowing. And, uh, and, and what's, what's the ultimate aim? So I don't know. I mean, perhaps actually your message shouldn't be don't m misjudge women, but your message should be going to Im immigrant communities or communities that are planning to send immigrants and tell them watch out before you send out your, uh, your immigrants. Perhaps that's not the best solution. The last point that I want to make, and this is actually a direct comment on something that you said. Uh, you said that at, uh, what, what, what you were doing, you were a photojournalist 30 years ago and you were trying to document how economic and social development work from the bottom up. And then you commented and you said we were idealist then or idealistic then. And I would like to comment on that. I would like to comment actually for the students. The rest of us are rotten. It's not going to help. We already are somehow gone. But those of you who are here for idealistic reasons, and I went to school and I stayed in this country for idealistic reasons, stay idealistic. We need to be idealistic. I mean, what's the opposite of idealistic, if I may ask Leslie? I mean, if we were idealistic then, what are we today? What is it exactly that we have moved into? To me, actually, it's really bleak what we have become. What, pragmatic? I guess that's the word. Is that what to, the word that we usually think of as the opposite of idealistic? Idealism is what really moves the world. It's not pragmatism, and it's not really success in whatever it is that we are successful in. It's this ability to actually face up to problems that seem to be insurmountable, think of totally, totally, totally unrealistic solutions to them, and go about find, uh, uh, pursuing and doing these solutions. So those of you who are younger than 40 in the audience, stay idealistic. Those of us who are above, I don't know, I mean, some of us perhaps still have it in their heart. Leslie clearly does. But the rest of us, I'm not sure. I speak for myself. I became somewhat pragmatic. Thank you, Leslie, for reminding me of what I want. Someone wants to turn up the lights and ask some questions or raise some issues? Yeah? Uh, my name is Pasadena, <coughs> from Turkey. Uh, I want to point out some things, uh, some uh, things. You, uh, Do you want to stand up and speak loudly? <laughs> <laughs> and you explain the story of one family, one family to us. And uh, in this story, I think, uh, they live in a very small uh, village. It should be less than 2,000. Because I am a Rupert and I visited most of the part of the Turkey. I haven't seen this part, uh, this part of the Turkey yet. And uh, you put out a lot of problems. I'm very sensitive problems. Women issues, immigration, and migration, and feminism, and Kurdish problems and Turkish problem, and also Alevism, Alevi problem. And these are very sensitive issues. And uh, from one family perspective, uh, I think uh, it is not, uh, how can I say, it is not correct 
to make generalization about these sensitive issues. You cannot do that with this information. And, uh, and also, you are not using any social um, scientific method. With, from one family perspective, you cannot make generalization. I think uh, at the end of uh, your uh, presentation, it is not clear to me still what is your conclusion about the which issue. Well, you brought up a lot of things, and maybe I can briefly respond on a few points. Um, I think I started by saying I am not a social scientist. I'm telling stories from one place. Um, as I said to Professor Robot, I'm not interested in influencing uh, urban policy or, you know, I, this, my goal is actually directed to a very different audience than, than you. Um, my goal is to take some women's stories and I would like to take these stories to, in a book form, in an exhibit form, to public libraries in the United States to give some of the American public an idea about how these women have radically changed their lives and have done things which I think the typical stereotyped idea of the Muslim woman that we get in the press that is so stereotypical and bizarre. Well, I, you know, if, I'm a photojournalist and if you, if you want to, you know, if you want to go to um, New Orleans and photograph all the people who are building nice houses or you go to New Orleans and photograph all the houses that haven't been rebuilt, I, I don't claim to have a comprehensive view. Um, I am not uh, making any uh, assumptions about um, people beyond the ones that I've had contact with. But I, as I said in the beginning, I think that for the purpose of making some human contact between cultures, there is, I believe, there's an advantage to telling stories about individuals, not social science statistics. That's up to the academics. And that if, if I could make some impact with opening up the minds of some people in other parts of the country about um, Muslim women, that they would have more compassion for this one family, then that's the extent of my goal. Um, it's storytelling. It's not social science. Um, you know, I I don't. Uh, it's one. You know, there's one village. It's a small village, um, and I'm very very aware of the sensitivity around discussing Kurds or Alevis. And I took the freedom to say some of those things in this room because I thought I could probably say it. Um, but those are. Those are people whom, for whom that's a Kurdish village and they've experienced a lot of discrimination. And um, it, it's a bigger topic. We could discuss you know, discrimination against Kurds in Turkey over many hours with many social scientists. But um, these are the personal stories that have and how it's impacted them. In fact, one of the things that they said about the Kurdish women who went to Adana is that often they got jobs that the Turkish women wouldn't get because their husbands allowed them to work in other people's homes, whereas some of the Turkish women in that area had stricter house rules and didn't get to go out and clean other people's homes. I mean, there's more to it, yes. Can we broaden the discussion? Yes. In the back, yeah? Um, Osama, uh, I saw one common thread in the story was the pursuit of education, especially in the, uh, the children of the new immigrants. And I'm wondering uh, at what stage was the pursuit of education on the minds of these immigrants, whether in the village, and that was one of the strong motivating factors to move to the city life, whether in London or in, in modern Turkish cities, or whether that uh, education route was thought upon more after the fact, after moving into the big cities, after realizing that that is more of the key toward success in those areas? Well, I think um, one of the things that happened was, at least out of this particular village, 
a lot of the men, as it often happens, went to work in the city first. And they, as Jafir said, sort of started to understand what education could offer their children, as well as knowing that they didn't want their children to be shepherds. So um, I, I mean, I don't think you could say um, that it suddenly dawned on them and then they moved. It was a sort of a slow process where people were coming back and forth between the village and the city seasonally and began to sort of understand. And you know, you people here know much more about this urbanization process than I could begin to expound on. But at least from the instance here, it was very clear that those people coming back from the city had a big influence. As well as sometimes they, um, they began to send out a few services to these places who had never, ever gotten any services. They began to be nurses and some teachers who came with ideas that had influence. But I still think it's a kind of an astounding thing that in such a short amount of time, that amount of change could take place. Yeah? I wanted to disagree with my friend here. I think um, some of these larger issues are best understood in their personal effects on people, and I really applaud your approach um, of looking at individuals and how it affects their lives, how the Kurdish issue, Alibi issue, women's issue affect their lives individually, because I think that's where we begin to make change. Um, my family story is very similar to this family story, and um, I think it does really wonderfully show larger trends which many, many, many families change, uh, that many, many families have experienced uh, in their lives. Um, I also want to ask you about, you mentioned that there was a television on all the time. How did you observe people's lives changing through the TV? I wondered if you had any recollections of that. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, I wasn't um, in the village when electricity arrived in that village. I had been in another village in the south in the 70s when electricity got there a lot sooner. And um, what it brought in were all those images of women that were really unacceptable in village culture. I mean, the ladies in the, with less clothing on and the soap operas with these bizarre situations. And, you know, um, I, you know it's, it's an exposure to a broader audience. And um, so I, you know, I, I can't, um, I think that the influence, you know, it began, it begins to do all of this cultural globalization, if you will. But um, then the the women with the TV on, that was in the city. What's really interesting about being in the Middle East, as many of you know, is that you can get television channels from 12 different countries. You know, you, I mean, it's it's a lot more open-minded than what we have on our television in that you can hear um, broadcasts from radically different views. So I imagine that has a big impact as well. Anyone else? Yes, Connie. Well, you mentioned the incredible uh, amount of change between these two generations. It, it really that hit me it just so fundamentally. How the, the mothers and the daughters within that period of time, the, the transition, the, the life changes they went through. I wonder if there was a political context generally within Turkey. I, with my limited knowledge of Ataturk and what he was trying to do to modernize the country, I, I just wonder if there was a momentum that was supported outside of even their cultural sort of intimate circle that would have supported those changes. Well, actually that, <clears throat> One of the first photographs that I showed at the beginning was, um, they weren't really village women, they were women in the city in, in 1975 who were marching. It, it wasn't May Day, it was International Women's Day. Um, so, you know, there, I, I, I would hate to try to capsulize um, several decades of Turkish social and political history, especially, um, but um, there were, there were certainly movements within the cities. Uh, there are certainly ad academic feminists in Istanbul who, um, you know, you would be very comfortable with 30 years ago discussing your ideas with, and the extent to which those ideas reach out to a village that is 600 miles away and inaccessible. It's, it, it seems to me that the the transitions that have happened sort of globally in terms of of change are a function of this interaction between the village and the city. And um, you can find in Turkey, you know, in the, in the 70s, there was, there was tremendous political anarchy and upheaval, and then there were coups. And, you know, the, the 
the political history um, is a part of it, but you know, I'd be, I, I couldn't begin to tell you what were the specific catalysts that you know lead from one thing to another. And yes. Uh, my name is Colin Clark. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Turkey in the 1960s, a teacher um, in southeastern Turkey in the Kurdish area. And just, I mean, this question of what was going on politically or what, what the Turkish government was perhaps uh, doing, there were, um, there were women teachers sent out all over Turkey. I mean, I, was, I happened to be an American, but there were... Turkish women teachers sent out into very sm small rural areas, not necessarily to vi villages, but small towns where they had middle schools, and where probably 20 years earlier it would have been just totally unheard of. So those kinds of experiences, you know, from the point of view of the people in rural areas, uh, certainly must have affected them to see, you know, young women um, coming as teachers and nurses and, and so on. So that's, that's another way that change comes about. And I would also say on the whole question of, of migration, it's not only that people want to go to the city. I mean, it's clear that there isn't the kind of work that people were doing in the villages 40 years ago is not there to be done anymore. It's, you know, Turkey is managing to provide itself with food and, and meat and so on, but the, the the human labor required to do that is much, much less. So it's inevitable that people, for whatever reasons individuals have, you know, this is a worldwide um, phenomenon. And, you know, there are the individual stories which are interesting, but the whole um, thing was inevitable anyway, the emptying out of the countryside and the growth of cities. And I'd like to turn to the, the other part of our, our series here is on photography as inquiry. Um, how marvelously your photograph showed the value of photography in uh, capturing these two times, 30 years apart. Uh, and your eye is really ex an extraordinary eye with a sensitivity to uh, the everyday. Um, the fact that as a 25-year-old, you laid the foundation in black and white photography uh, for what you were able to come back and build on 30 years later uh, is a testimony to your, you know, to your talent back then. In the sense that the power of what you showed us today was the movement back and forth um, between the black and white and the color photographs. Um, I guess a, a question that I have for you as a photographer is uh, how did this experience um, of coming back, how did it change your, your eye? You know, how did it change you as a photographer? Did it change you as a photographer? How did you feel coming back that you had developed as a photographer in the meantime? Well, the, before I answer your question, I want to go to the first thing, which because you are, you and Spurn are very soon to be putting out a book that looks at Dorothea Lange's work, I have to give all the credit to my 1970 photographs to the fact that Dorothea Lange was the person I considered the one I wanted to become. You know that, that I I imitated her. I tried to be like her, and, um, and it was um, in terms of how did the photography change. Um, I went back with a, an automatic camera with a flash and shot color. And um, I think I've come to feel that that isn't my preferred way of shooting. But that I had to do that then. I, I, I felt I needed to get the information. I needed to use a flash to get inside. I needed, And um, I, it's a quandary to me now because I do have this, um, there are certain aspects of the black and white photography which are still very strong to me and, and I'm kind of curious about what it would be like to now go back and do some black and white photography with the um, quality of light. But for the purpose of, of this, um, the garishness of the color is a part of the message, you know, the, that, I mean, it truly does carry some of the, the um, information 
that. Um, so uh, it's it set me up to be. I think I'll have to be more experimental in the future about which which way I go and how I use it. But I'm certainly far more aware now of the impact of those bright lit colors. <laughs> yes. Just a small comment. Uh, Turkish woman teachers, role, uh, acting as role models, goes all the way back to the 30s, uh, alphabet uh, revolution and so on. No, I'm aware that the, there were sort of village school teachers that got sent out. I had a friend who grew up in all of those little village schools because his, his father was one of those teachers in the... My mother was admired by all the women in the little town. Yeah. She was a teacher. Well, I think one of the things that people also don't realize about Turkey is that, you know, in 1975, things like there were more, larger percentage of women doctors and lawyers in Turkey than there were in the United States. I mean, that there are different aspects to which, you know, maybe starting with Ataturk, the society started to change, didn't take exactly the same routes that, uh, you know, we in the West think are the ones that you ought to take. But there were innovations then. But still. Maintain a separate identity, and I wonder, especially now with northern Iraq and the possibility of a Kurdish state, did you sense some antagonism uh, toward the Turks, toward the Kurds, because of this uh, separate identity? Well, when I visit in Turkey, I'm visiting with friends, so we can talk openly. And as you can tell, some of my best friends are Kurdish, so um, their experiences are often different from people who from farther west in Turkey who have not lived in the east or been in the east. And um, it's, a, it's such a sensitive subject. I don't even discuss Kurds with some of my Turkish friends because um, their experiences are so different and their education is so different. And it's, uh, I think just as, say, racism is a really hard topic to discuss in, in our country, you know, the Kurdish issue is equally explosive, and it all depends upon whose living you, room are you in and what their family experiences were. I mean, the, there are also, um, you know, certain things people won't talk about with me because I'm a foreigner and because people's political histories, um, they don't want to be known. So um, it's, it's very complicated and it's very hard, but there's certainly a lot of, you know, it's going to be a long time before all those things are easily spoken about among different people. Marsha? I just want to thank you for seeing these photographs in this way um, for, and the stories. For, because I think in the storytelling and in the personal aspect of photojournalism, it gives an emotional impact of what these changes mean to a person, to a family, in a way that you can't necessarily get in just straight dry scholarship. Because it allows you to sort of feel and project into their lives and imagine what those changes viscerally mean. So I think, I think it's, especially for a non-scholar like myself, very valuable to prompt questions about what does immigration mean. And the sadness that you can't go back you can't go home again. And what do you do about those losses? I mean, how, how will her children maintain their cultural identity as they have their children? Thank you. Mm. I have two questions. Um, very different. The first one is the Turkish state, if it is publicly, is secular. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what the impact of that secularism is on women's emancipation in Turkey. And the second question is different. But what is the effect of this emancipation on men? And how, how have men changed? And how, how do you see women being different as, say, mothers? Because that has a lot to do with how patriarchal society is also changed. Well, I don't think I'm necessarily qualified to comment on all of that. <laughs> That's a pretty big question. I think what is what, it, what separates Turkey from some, or distinguishes Turkey, I would say, from some of the other Middle Eastern countries, as you have pointed out, is that this secularism was established in 1923 when the Republic was established, and that you know, it 
radically altered the course of history there. And some of the edicts that were put forward in the 20s and 30s, you know, that women shouldn't wear veils and people had the vote. I mean, it didn't happen overnight, even though that was in the law. I mean, there's much of the change has taken place, has moved along slowly or in spotily. But the fact that you start with a foundation of, you know, voting rights and legal rights is just a huge, I mean, that's what you have to turn back to when you're trying to make these changes. Um, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't, um, I think it would be foolish of me to, to make some sort of gross generalizations about the men as well. I mean, I, um, I mean I, I'd be happy to, to talk about it with you, but it's, um, it's a huge topic. <laughs> and how has Turkey changed in the last 75 years for men and women? I, um, no, yeah. instances from your stories, I, I don't Well, I mean, the wonderful thing is that you, you um, you see with the, the women pushing either very subtly or more openly for their, their rights, their economic freedoms and so forth, you know, yes, in 30 years, what's, you know, the men gets pushed along as well. And um, in some families that causes great friction. In some families, it just, everyone benefits. So um, it depends a lot on class about what you're, you know, where your education level is, you know, there, there's so many variables. And Estelle, I, want, I wanted to go back to, the, you asked you about the Northern Kurds. There's, there's, not, um, there's, not, much, there's not much support in, in, for separation. I mean, no, I, mean, I, I don't hear support in my own experience for, um, a separatist movement, that the separatist movement was a, a fairly narrow um, movement. And that's, I mean, it's, so. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.